Hey, it's Gerald from Lakers Fast Break. Anchor is the easiest way to make your next podcast. It's absolutely free, and their creation tools will allow you to record and edit your show right from your phone or your home computer. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on great podcast outlets like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started on your next podcast. And we're back with another episode of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here from Lakers Fast Break, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, Game Source, and of course, also as well, Pop Culture Cosmos. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our great shows. If you can, please give us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts. But also as well, if you can like, subscribe, follow, share, whatever you can do to support us right here at the Lakers fast break. Plus also Raphael's awesome shows. It is truly appreciated. Well, the Lakers did manage to go ahead and finish off the Portland trailblazers in five games. Score was 131 to 122. I had told Tom on our previous podcast that I was expecting kind of a flat performance. And while we didn't get that offensively, we didn't get much of a defensive uh, presence at any point in time in the game. But I will say this, the Lakers close out the game strong on a 20-7 to run, which finished off the Portland Trail Blazers. But give Portland credit, they fought hard. Uh, they did not have Damian. They were down to nine players. They didn't have Lillard. They didn't have Collins. They didn't have a number of players on their team. They were down to nine active players. And you know what? I give Terry Stotts and the entire team credit for putting up a fight all the way through they could have caved in early in the third quarter when the Lakers went up by double digits, but they fought back, tied the game, and we're looking to give the Lakers quite a challenge, but the Lakers did come out on top. AD and LeBron, just two incredible performances today. AD with 43 points, LeBron James with 36 and 10 assists. Overall, just another great game by those two, and they got just enough of a supporting cast uh caldwell pope with 14 white howard with 11 i really liked alex caruso's hustle and grit and uh timely defensive plays kuzma a great effort on defense not well executed on offense but again it was just a great performance by those two ad and lebron once again and here today uh to talk about everything as far as this game and going forward here are three great guys starting off with my good friend you know him as the man behind NBA Draft Junkies. You got to go ahead and subscribe today to NBA Draft Junkies on YouTube. Check out his page, nbadraftjunkies.com. And not only his great show, NBA Draft Junkies, all over the podcast apps, but his second great show, all over the podcast apps, that is Run the Floor. It is Rafael Barlow. And Rafael, what are the things that you can take away most from Portland? I will also go ahead and hit you up later on on what Portland needs to work on in the offseason. But for this game, I saw a lot of grit and determination and not a sense of quit at all from the Portland Trailblazers. Yeah, I mean, they came out. They played hard. I I don't think we would have been shocked either way if they came out and made it competitive or if they came out and got smacked by 40. I don't think you'd be surprised with either result. I thought the young guys played well. I thought Melo played like we needed him to play in the previous games. Um, Ant Simons has a bright future. I think same with uh, Trent Jr. CJ was he, was, he was a tough matchup tonight, but it was just too much LeBron and AD. And, I mean, it, those two guys are the only ones that really showed up on the offensive end. And, I mean, I guess when you have those two guys <laughs> – 
you can win games with only two guys contributing like that. But LeBron came out focused. Uh, AD looked good. And, you know, the Lakers just, they, I mean, at one point I felt like they were coasting a little bit. Yeah. And uh, But they turned it on in the last five minutes. I thought Portland had a chance when it was tied up at maybe like 110 or something like that. And then after that, it was it was game over. So well, I think but it was Le- a good effort for the Blazers. So. I think LeBron came back into the game, and once those two decided to go ahead and put the hammer down, it looked like uh, you, like you were talking about all throughout the series. When LeBron is aggressive, the Lakers are hard to stop. And when he started going to the basket – that really set the tone for the Lakers. And when he kind of, like you said, put the pedal off the metal, I saw the Lakers do the, all, the entire team do the same thing, especially on the defensive end. Yep. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, I guess it's a good series for the Laker fans. First, what, is it the first series win since 11-12? Uh, 12, yep. yeah, yeah. Yep. So, uh, like I said, we've, Got a series victory now as we wait for the winner of Oklahoma City and Houston. Right now, Houston's up three games to two. But with us also today to talk about the Lakers and their victory over the Portland Trailblazers is Magic Man, a.k.a. Sean Grice. And Sean, uh, I'm sure you got to be happy with some of the things today that went on. Obviously, uh, you know, both LeBron and AD were clicking today. Would have liked to have gotten more help, but enough defense. I didn't say it was a great defensive performance at all, but they got just just enough defense to go ahead and sneak by in what, to me, I think has to be categorized as an underwhelming performance. Oh, absolutely, Gerald. I would agree. I think uh, in games like this, like you said, LeBron will decide to just become aggressive and take it over. Uh, it often reminds – like those two often remind me now of um, – Pat Mahomes and Travis Kelsey, and that they just decide when they're going to pick you apart and when they feel that matchups favor, you know, somebody like a Tyree Kill or uh, any number of running backs they have that they can put on wheel routes. It just, LeBron, to me, is, is acting like a quarterback right now. He's just deciding when to take over and when to grind it out. Well, I could tell he, right now that's what he likes to do. He likes to, you know, just be that maestro that you know is orchestrating the entire game per se. And when he's able to dictate and impose his will on the game, it's really hard for anybody to go ahead and match up with that. Also with us today is a good friend of ours as well. You know he's got to be here when the Lakers win. He's the mastermind behind Lakerholics.com. You got to go ahead and be part of the conversation today at Lakerholics.com. I know him as Tom Wong, but you know him as Laker Tom. And Laker Tom, like I was talking about with Sean, not exactly the best performance. And like I was saying with Raphael, not exactly the defensive kind of stout you really want to see from the team. No, yeah, we talked about this yesterday that uh, it was a big question because the Lakers, every time the Lakers seem to get momentum going, some event out of their control seems to throw a log jam in front of them. And uh, this three-day strike that we went through, uh, all of the turmoil of uh, whether the season was, uh, season was playoffs were going to be canceled and, or not, um, all of the backlash that uh, Stephen, Stephen A. Smith has unleashed uh, against LeBron, saying that he's uh, alienated the young guns in the league and he's alienated some of the owners. Um you had to expect that the the team was going to come out and and not have the same level of performance that they did, you know, when the when the, in the last game before the strike. Um, I think there are a lot of positives about it. One one big positive in my mind was that they were able to turn the switch. Um, I've always felt from the very beginning this was going to be at best a five game series. I thought that the chance for a six game series or a sweep were about the same thing. It came out in five games, and I think I think what really transpired was you had a number one seed versus a number eight seed. And I don't mean any disrespect for the Portland Trailblazers. Um, they'd be a much higher seed in the East because the West was really, really a very tough conference this year and a lot of good teams. You look at Portland as number eight, and, uh, and I think uh, number seven was the Dallas Mavs. Um, those are some pretty good ball teams there, there. 
I, I think in an ordinary season where they didn't have so many injuries, they'd be a, a third, three to five seed. Maybe, maybe, but they they have some. The problem they have is they don't play defense. I mean, that's yeah, the that, that, that's it's the been problem. a problem all year long. And when you get into the playoffs, the defense really, really counts. And I think the Lakers proved that they had another switch that they could turn on. And then they had another gear defensively that they could turn on. I don't want to say they don't play defense. I mean, obviously, when they give up 131 points, you can't say that they play defense effectively the entire time. But I'm sure Raphael. Well, hold on here. Hold on. Hold on. I, I'm sure Raphael would probably want to interject. They have some players on that team who can play effective defense, but it's hard when your guards, your two lead guards, are the size that they are. And then also the fact that I saw Gary Trent Jr., who is is playing as hard as he can, playing some really smart defense at times. It's just not enough as far as defensive presence at the right spots. But again, Rafael, what are you seeing as far as from Portland is concerned? Well, the roster is imbalanced. I mean, even if they were healthy, they would have started Collins at the five. I don't think I – mean, I'm sorry, at the four. I don't think he's a five. Portland doesn't have a four – like a switchy four. I mean, I guess Ariza would, you know, fit that that need, but he didn't play that many games. So I think if Ariza was there, I mean, if healthy, Collins would be playing more minutes than Jalen Horde and Queen Gabriel. But at the end of the day, I mean, we can only speculate and say what if. And we didn't we weren't a healthy team this year. And we had Melo playing a lot of minutes at the at the three, which I think he's a four in today's NBA. And just the roster wasn't balanced. So I think, um, you know, going forward, they should be happy with the young guys, guys that were kind of pushed into playing time in the playoffs. They got some experience. And now you bring in, you know, Rodney Hood. He should be back. Ariza should be back next year. And then I don't think Whiteside would be back just because I really don't have a need for him. But, um, yeah, I mean, overall, I think if the Blazers were healthy, they wouldn't be an eighth seed. But you were eighth seed, and, we, you know, when you're eighth, you face the best team, and it's not a favorable matchup in, in that place. But, you know, <laughs> season's over for us, so you can't really spend too much time talking about what if. Well, now I want to ask you this before we go back to you guys. Uh, when I talked about what is needed for Portland, you talked about Melo, and that's one thing I'm watching Melo now, and – you see how effective he can be spotting up on the outside. And yep. when he's doing his old mellow stuff and, you know, I heard the announcer vintage mellow, vintage mellow, vintage mellow, that's playing right into the other team's hands, so to speak. But when he plays that outside pick and pop game from the three pointer, he can really still find a value, a great value in this league. Yeah, I think so. It's just a matter of him fully accepting that role I think also when he plays his vintage mellow style, he needs a bunch of shots to kind of keep going. And when you're the fourth option, you're not going to be able to get six, seven possessions and you're not going to be able to find your, your rhythm. You have to knock down open shots and um, see, I would like him to come back. I wouldn't like him as a starter. I think he could be, a devastating six man, especially if he wants to pick and pop. I think that would be, and he did it one of the plays. I think him and Simons ran a pick and pop at the top of the key and they scored. If he can accept that, it's kind of like Dwight in a sense, like, you know, Dwight just decided I'm going to be a role man. He'd be dominant. But when he wants post touches and kind of slows the offense down, I, he's less effective, but you know, it's easy for me to say because I was never like a perennial all-star. I was never like on this high level that they were on. And and I think once you reach a certain height in your career, it's kind of hard to accept the role as a, a role player. And I think both are still somewhat reluctant at times to accept that role. This is Raphael from NBADraftJunkies.com, and you are listening to the Lakers Fast Break. Hey, Lakers fans. Looking for the best place to go for up-to-date news, information, original videos, articles, podcasts, opinion pieces, and discussions about the Los Angeles Lakers? Well, look no further than Lakerholics.com. With a legion of followers always there talking about everything Lakers and the NBA, 
there's no better place to go to share your fandom as the team heads toward another championship run. So stop by and be part of the conversation today at Lakerholics.com. So let's say I put you in that GM role Mm because I know what a great job you do evaluating players. What are some of the things that you're looking forward to do doing as far as, as a GM, as far as some of the moves you might consider making? We know where there are in the draft. Okay, they've got a middle pick, mm-hmm. middle round pick in the draft that's you know may or 16. may not yes, it may or may or not help you in that. You know, you know, you and I have been evaluating this. We're not even sure how far or how many players are going to be effective at that next level. You know, when it concerns this near this next draft. But if you're talking about what you can do to effectively make changes that you can become even more competitive later this year or early next year, whenever we start the season, what would you be looking at? I think it's tough. I've thought about this a lot. I'd see what Aaron Gordon's availability would be. I think he would be a good four. He would provide athleticism, may be able to switch out and defend threes and fours, but I don't know if we have the pieces to make it work for Orlando. Hmm. I would like to keep Dame and CJ together. I would like to keep Nurk together. So outside of that, I don't think that the pieces that the Blazers have would be able to get them a player of Gordon's caliber. So I'd have to, um, you know, trying to add pieces through the draft. I think Sadiq Bey from Villanova would be a good fit because he shot 45% from three. He can defend threes and fours, but he's also a good ball handler. Yeah. He, you know, they played him a lot at point forward there. So I think that he would be a good fit. As far as free agency, it's tough to say what any team can do in free agency because we don't know what the money's going to be like. And then the Blazers cap situation is pretty tight anyway. So you're just going to have to develop from within. And hopefully you can get a pick at six, a player at 16 that can come in and contribute right away. So. It's, it's going to be tough, but that would, that would be my, my plan. There you go. Once do, you again, think they, go ahead. do you think they should consider trading Dame or CJ, breaking that up? Because... Well, that's what I was going to ask you. You said no, Raphael. No, because I, I think um, if they can fix the defense, they'd be fine. One of the things that the Blazers have that a lot of teams don't have is two guys that can get their own shot. So if you get in a situation where it's late in the shot clock, they have two guys that can break the defense down and score. Um, but it's hard to do that when, you know, you're just a bad defensive team and you don't have depth. And I think the same issue is going to face uh, the Nuggets. They have they have guys that can score, but when they need to stop, they don't have enough guys that can – well, they have too many guys that are playing major minutes that aren't defensive stoppers. But I but think they, they can work. They've made several decisions in in players. Uh, they've got they had a couple of of excellent wing defenders the last couple of years that they lost. And Aminu and Harkless. It, and it, and it seems like it seems to me like they're they're caught in that never never land, which is yeah. they're not good enough to get a lottery. They're not bad enough to get a lottery pick, but they're not good enough really to get past the first round of this playoffs. Well, you remember they're one year removed from a Western Conference Finals. Yeah, I know that, Gerald, but if you look at what if, – if just take a look at the team. I mean, there's been this discussion about whether or not they should break up Dame and – because they've got two players that have got some real value. You could get some, you could get some real assets for CJ uh, and keep Dame, and if you really wanted to rebuild and, and get a lot of power, uh, Dame, would, Dame would get a, as big a ticket. I mean, he's – the Lakers were considering offering that whole package that they gave for AD for Dame at one point in time. So you just have to look at the franchise and think of where you want to go, um, because otherwise, I you know, adding a player in the draft, signing somebody for the MLE is not going to really change the dynamic of the team, and it's been the same really for the last three or four years. They at one point were a much better defensive team. They lost some good wings, um, and now now they're stuck in this situation where. They can they can score on people. They and Nur- Nurkic is a good player. Uh, I like Gary Trent Jr. I think he looks very promising, and I also like Simons. So you've got four guys that are basically perimeter players there, um, and you've got two guys who have some real value at this point in time, great value probably for for a competitive for a competing team. 
Um, and you have to think if I was if I was the general manager, I, I think that without publicizing it, I'd sure want to go out there and and talk to other GMs to find out what what could I get for one of these two guys. Well, See, the last I, I, it, if you oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no. Go ahead, Raphael. Okay. Well, the way I see it, if you look at the West, let's say the last five years, what player could you label a winner in the playoffs in the last five years? Every only person that has oh, somewhat been successful is James Harden, and he's considered a playoff loser. He's the only guy that's been to the Western Conference Finals twice. Dame has been out the first the round. The players who have dominated the situation. Right. So I think no matter what you do, you're going to end up in the same situation. I mean, Paul George hasn't won a playoff series since he left Indiana. Westbrook hasn't won a playoff series since Kevin Durant left. Kawhi hasn't won a playoff series in the West since the year he got hurt. So I think maybe that was the Warriors' second year, maybe. But there's, so, three, now there's three great teams in the West that they've got to go past. Well, yeah, think- so if you make a trade, are you going to make a trade and get and become better than those teams? Yeah, I mean, I, I maybe you've got to get a trade to get up to that level of those. You have to just decide what you're going to do. Are you going to be satisfied just to, to be in the playoffs every year? Tom, I think Magic Man wants to put in something right here. Go ahead, Magic. Yeah, I was just going to say um, we're definitely going to see where the economics of the uh, new NBA take us because Paul Allen did pass away, and um, and his I believe his wife now – has control over both the Blazers and the Seahawks, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I just think breaking up Dame and CJ, it's kind of hard to sell if I was owning that team. Well, well, trading away Dame. It, trading away Damien is not the yeah, one that they're going to no, do. I mean, if, if we're going to trade away Dame, then we start at ground zero again, and we make sure we get a nice package for him. You trade CJ to the Warriors for those two draft picks and maybe their number 12 pick. That's a heck of a And trade. that just gets us to the lottery again next year. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, but, but you also get a lottery player this year and, and you're strong in cards. We're, 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 what we're, finding, draft out, what we're maybe. finding out more and more is that the draft capital is very scarce. And it's not like in the NFL where, where every year – can draft a quarterback and see if he pans out because that's the number one position in the NFL. If you get a quarterback in the first round, great. Fourth round, great. But if you get one that's that's really good, it works out. In the NBA, it's a little different, right? We've got two rounds, and like Raphael and Gerald were saying, sometimes the draft is it, it doesn't bear fruit. Well, it, it can be a crap, no doubt about sometimes. it. <laughs> well, yeah, look at the Lakers. That, how many lottery picks did they have that right, right. did Number nothing? And well, I mean, I think it's more than that because you had Randall, you had Russell, you had Ingram, you had Ball, and the only reason the Lakers were able to benefit from those picks is because they got LeBron James, who brought in Anthony Davis. Without that, all those picks meant nothing. Yeah, but that's an advantage that LA has. All right, hold on, hold on, one at a time, one at a time. Go ahead, go ahead, Laker Tom. Um. To me, I just, you know, I, if I look out at the general managers and what they do for their teams, the guy who has always impressed me more than anybody else, and, and you guys probably don't agree with me, but it's Daryl Morey. He's not afraid to make big moves, and he's not afraid to, to, to go out there and do things. I think CJ has great value on the market, and I think that they could, they could, they could bring – they have other good guards. They have two guys – Trent Jr. could play shooting guard, and and I, and I really like Simons. Yep. Um, and so you have to look at where they're weak. They're, they're, you know, they basically need a great center, somebody who can really block shots and defend, but isn't a, isn't a liability overall the way that the way the white side is. I don't know what kinds of deals are out there, but I know that if CJ was available, or if they were looking at it, that that they're there's got to be deals out there that could improve that roster. And, and like you said, Raphael, the, the roster is not balanced. They're so strong at the guard position now. And there's just opportunities out there that it all comes down to what your philosophy is. And, and Sean's right that, you know, 
it may be that the the coronavirus pandemic and its effect on on the NBA is going to make make it very difficult for a small market team like the like the Blazers to to want to make a change. Otherwise, they're just going to be they're going to be stuck in that same situation, and it's going to be harder and harder to advance. They're not going to get back to the Western Conference Finals. You well, said, I think every team in the West is in the same situation. I yeah. mean, if Utah. You can say the same thing about Utah. They've been running in place for the last five years. The Thunder haven't won a playoff series in like yeah, five they years. Got, they got they got draft picks galore, and they can rebuild in a whole different way than anybody else in the league can at this point. And it still may take like five years. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's bad for five. I mean, think about the Lakers. The Los Angeles Lakers won their first playoff series since 2012. Yep. So it just shows yeah. that. Well, they they lottery have picks bad and bad some bad Hold management. on, Laker Tom. Let let Raphael finish. But they still had the number two pick, what, three three times? They had Julius Randle. They got good players. Unless you get that Doncic, that guy that can come and change your franchise and make everybody better right away, I don't know if it happens. And then your draft, you're depending on 19-year-olds to well, change your it franchise. Doesn't to, it doesn't have to be picks that you trade them for. I mean, they're – like I don't know, like like when you say you need a center that block shots and that can defend in space, like who? <laughs> maybe maybe you could trade him for uh, for it may him him and and uh, Gary Trent Jr. for a combination like uh, Oladipo and Simon, uh, uh, the center from uh, Oh Turner, Miles Turner, right? But then I think Oladipo is going to Miami. Anyway, so it's tough. I mean, like I said, every team in the West, even like with Houston, they've been to the Western Conference Finals, and one of the things they've been able to do is avoid like being in the lottery and rebuilding, and they've changed the roster a lot, but they've, you know, they're still somewhat kind of running in place. They're like at the top of the well, bottom. The Warriors, have, the Warriors have dominated it for all of these years, and and the Warriors are going to be back in the mix again next year, you know? Yeah. You know, you know what's really wrong? Go ahead, Magic Man. Yeah, no, I was going to say uh, Raphael made a, a great point there. Uh, like, the Rockets remind me a lot of the Texans in the NFL. They'll win, like, nine or ten games in a year. They'll make the playoffs, you know, four out of five years, three out of five years, but they'll lose in a divisional round. Or, you know, they're just, like he said, they're, like, at the top. They're at the bottom of the top. Well, they- if they lose to the Lakers in the second round, all of that is wiped out. I yeah. mean, I think there's going to be a new coach. Oh, Dan Tony's gone, probably. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So, He's going to get another job. I'll, I'll guarantee you that. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's still a lot more to talk about here because the Lakers are going on to the next round. And we'll go ahead and hit up on that before we close out the show, not only talking about the rest of the playoff games, but also uh, pay some respects to those who were honored before the game uh, based off their passing, their recent passing. So, before we head on out, guys, let's go ahead and touch on the Lakers. Uh, and that is, uh, you, what, what do they need to go ahead and focus on? Because it is looking more and more like it's going to be Houston. Houston did come back with a very, very strong second half performance against Oklahoma City. Uh, but it is looking more and more like the Rockets are going to be the, the team that the Lakers are going to match up against. If you're scouting the Los Angeles Lakers magic man, if you're scouting them, you're sitting there up on the uh, in the rafters right there. What are you looking at, and what are you going to go ahead and suggest to the staff of the Lakers as far as what the Lakers need to focus on going forward with the Rockets? Definitely, Gerald. Um, I would I would call it exploiting the rings of Saturn or the rings of AD and his offense. Um, he is so multi layered offensively. I just think it's going to be difficult for Houston to find a matchup consistently to stall him. But they may be willing to go ahead and say, go, go and get your 40 points. We'll go ahead and, you know, we've seen focus in on letting the Lakers shoot. Now today they, they shot 38%. If the Lakers can shoot 38% from the three point area, all bets are off. But how many times consistently have they done that in the playoffs? No, no doubt, no doubt. That's a valid point. Uh, what I would Four say games in a row. is that uh, Houston is a very poor transition defending team. Um, we've talked a lot about 
you know, how AD and LeBron, if they get frustrated on the offensive end because of a call or a no call, will tend to hang back and uh, watch the action. Uh, other guys on that team don't do that. Danny Green hustles back. KCP hustles back. Alex hustles back. I see Kuz doing it. With Houston, I see the opposite. If if uh, Harden isn't running back, I could see Covington or Jeff Green. They're not really hustling that, that fast either. You know, they're a poor transition team. And, you know, AD tonight was 9 of 10 from the third and fourth quarter from outside of 20 feet. So if you're a poor defending transition team and AD still able to hit that 20 footer, I just don't see a way out. Now, Laker Tom, you were telling me something. You I heard you saying four games in a row. Uh the Lakers have not shot over 38% over in four games in a row. No, but they've shot four they've shot well enough in four games in a row not to have any big differential. Well, okay. Well, that, well yeah. enough. I'm glad you corrected that to well enough. So, well, that, it, listen, the three-point game comes down, and when we're talking about the Rockets, the Rockets averaged 18 makes a game versus 12 makes a game for Oklahoma City. Um, that's that already you're talking almost a 20-point differential, and actually the difference was seven. I just calculated it before, not, not including tonight's game. The differential was 21 points. The Lakers lost that first game to the Portland Trail Blazers because they had a differential of three-point shooting of eight, three, eight threes or 24 points. So with the Rockets, you basically have to take enough shots so that you don't have a huge difference there because you can't, you can't get enough twos to make up for a difference when you get in into the range of, of 20, 24, 21, 24 points. So I think the key thing is that the Lakers in the last four games – shot well enough that they really didn't have any huge deficit. And in many of the cases were actually positive as compared to the Blazers three point shooting. Um, I mean, that's the real weakness that, that the Lakers have to worry about with the Rockets. They're going to put up 50 to 63s every game. They had 54, they averaged 54 attempts per game. Um, and if you, if you can't shoot enough threes to match that, then you're in trouble, and and their whole strategy is based upon wanting to sucker the teams that don't have a center or that that have centers and have big men that can score. They want to sucker you to try to beat them by scoring more twos, and they can score threes. Well, you, you know, you play, you play into their hands if you try to pound the ball inside. You need to control the boards, but you need to do a lot of driving and dishing, and you need to shoot a lot of wide open threes so you get a high percentage, and you can combat that game that they try to do they try to turn it into a into a into a three-point contest and you just have to prevent them from doing that um it comes down to the same thing that this is this is not a really dissimilar series than the blazers series in a lot of ways well the blazers play two traditional big men and the rockets play no play small ball all the way the difference is you have two elite pairs of guards that you have to stop the only the only disadvantage that we or the only advantage we have in playing the Rockets is that you can let Westbrook shoot those long shots and you want him to shoot them. You want to just keep him off of the drive. So we, we double team we double team Harden the same as we did Dame. We let we basically make sure that AD is is going to be running the paint and protecting the rim, and you have to start Kuzma instead of Javale. And so my question is: It's going to be another five-game series. Go ahead, Rafael. How does, and then I know Sean. How does uh, how does AD protect the rim when they're going to have him on a a guy in the corner? I think that's going to gonna, be the tough gonna, matchup. They're going to have to make adjustments. They're just going to have to make adjustments throughout the course of the series. Because I don't it, think there's there's one strategy you can take. Because there's also the fact that when it is spread out like that, and you're right, Raphael, AD is covering the wing or has to cover the wing. That leaves cover whoever is the worst three point shooter on the team. But that also leaves open for drives against uh, Westbrook and Harden because they love going to the basket when you try to go ahead and face up on them too high off the three point area. So we we've defended Harden well in the past by doubling him. We can do that. You just double Harden. You double hard and force him to get the ball out. He'll beat you enough times. 
but it's still the best way to defend him. Raphael? You put AD on whoever is the weakest or coldest three-point shooter that you have on the team. Raphael? I think AD is going to end up on Westbrook a lot on switches. That's fine. That's the guy you want to have guarding Westbrook when he drives to the rim. Yeah, I mean, it depends on if how they're calling you know, the game. That, 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 if you get AD in foul trouble, the whole, then... The whole, the whole idea of having AD out there is that if you have a Casey or a, a Danny Green, you want to close off those passing lanes so that if Covington or who else is in the corner, they're, they're forced to make those shots. Like you said, Raphael, if if a 3 and D guy, if he's not hitting his threes, the D is meaningless pretty much. Mm-hmm. So I'll tell you what right now, there's a lot to look forward to when it comes to the next round of the uh, NBA playoffs, most likely against Houston. Laker, Tom, I know you wanted to say something else. Uh, any last thoughts on as far as the yeah, Houston yeah, for now? I'll just throw this out because this is crazy. But, um... Oh, well, gee, that's something that you would never say. No. <laughs> something that I think is really merits a lot of makes a lot of sense and that is i would like to see the lakers double team harden coming across the court and then i would like to see them basically play a three-man zone behind that double team with ad in the middle and two guys covering the corners let them have above the break threes okay don't let don't give them the layups because you got ad down low so, so you, you're, the corner you're, you're thinking you're tom you're thinking don't don't let James Harden get to the elevator. Talking about something like a triangle and two, or you're talking something about uh... it's it's basically a two three D. It's basically a mm-hmm. two three, except the two guys at the two three zone, except the two guys at the top go to Harden. I mean, I kind of like Westbrook in an advantage because one thing about the Rockets, when Harden and Westbrook are on the floor. It's a matter of them making their shots. They're getting wide open looks in the corner every time. Westbrook can generate an open play just because he puts so much pressure. So you you got to take the corner threes away from these teams. Oh, that's the hard part. They make the extra pass. and it's a, You have to respect his closeness still. You're, you're talking about collapse. doubling hard in. You're talking about uh, you know facing up with AD on Westbrook. And then you're saying they still have to go ahead and cover the corners. You double Harden and you leave AD in the middle to take Westbrook when he tries to drive. Okay, well, at least that's not as bad as you saying I was, what I was thought you might be leading into is that actually getting a sixth player off the bench for the Lakers to go ahead. Because it seems like you want all these players all over the floor. So. No, but when you think about it, when you think about it, what, you know, they make more, they take and they make more corner threes than any team in the league because Daryl Morey, believes in corner threes. Or well, why it's wouldn't you? It, it, it helps set up their defense as well. That that's that's one of the keys against the Lakers. Again, they're a poor transition team, right? So yep. if they are hitting their threes, they're able to set their defense and you have to work in the half court. Yeah. And the other thing though, you gotta be careful, even though they even though they're not good on getting back on defense, you don't want to get into a run and gun game where they're getting wide open threes off of transition. No, you you're right. That. I think I think that'd be a trap. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's so many traps with them. They're a trap team all the way. You know, it's a gimmick team. Um, that's the other thing. It's an advantage in a series when you play a seven game series, or in this case, I think it's going to be a five game series. You you have adjustments that you don't get when you're going into in a one off in a regular season. We right. haven't even had a may may not have even had a practice before you actually meet them, <laughs> but. You know, helping off of the corner is going to kill anybody who plays the Rockets. I mean, that whole thing is it just really totally, I and mean, when I look at it from a coaching standpoint, it makes so much sense to keep to play a zone against them with AD in the center and guys covering the corners and then let the guys on top, just depending on who's got the ball. If, if, if Westbrook has the ball, then sag on him. If, if Harden has the ball, double him. Well, I think with Westbrook, even if you sag on him, you give him a launching pad to come right into you. And then also what I like what the Rockets do, and I've seen teams try to shut down the corner, is they're good at making the extra pass. So if they have Covington and Tucker in the corner, rather once than you that, close out, it's McLemore yeah. and Gordon who yeah. knock down yeah, shots. Rather it's an above-the-break three that they pass from the corner than an than a above-the-break pass into the corner. Sean? You got to give him something. That's that's yeah, how no, played in the NBA. Sean? Yeah, no, I was going to say Raphael made a great point there. Uh, 
that's why Anthony likes having Macklemore and House out there because those guys do make the extra pass. Yeah. Well, again, we're going to be seeing a lot more of Houston in the coming days, most likely, and we'll have our predictions coming up in the next coming in the next few days, uh, because it looks like the the Houston Rockets are on their way to go ahead and finish off the Oklahoma City Thunder, unless OKC can find some type of formula going forward. But we'll go ahead and assume right now that Houston is going to be the matchup for the Lakers in the next round. So Lakers do have an extra couple of days to go ahead and. Take when a look would at, the first game, when would the first game be? Do you know that, uh, Gerald? Well, not for, not for sure because again, you know, Game Six is still going to happen for OKC and Houston. They win, so they I, play I think uh, be a Thursday or Friday, if I'm not. That's, that's a long time. That's that is a long time. But you got to remember, uh, they have the game on Monday, Game Six. If they win, then it'll probably start at least Wednesday or Thursday. Okay. If not, then you're probably talking it, and it goes to a Game Seven. You would not be starting the game until possibly as late as Saturday. So, you know, that's yeah. something to think about they, right there. So. Yeah, they have game seven of Houston OKC. It would be scheduled for Wednesday if it was yeah. a game seven. So that that means that, that the first game, game one, Friday. would either be Friday or Saturday. So depending on uh, TV coverage well, and the way they want. Friday would probably be logical because they're going to want to try to make up time. Oh, you also want to go ahead and for, it's made for TV. So what's best for TV? So you got to Here's a question for everybody. That's why you... it's TBD. TBD. <laughs> okay. Here's a question for everybody. Do you think that Frank is going to actually bench JaVale? No. No. Yes. Not in game one. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. I think he, because if you break up the starting five that got you the number one seed after playing, not even playing Houston, you just already conceded, like, you know, we don't match up well with them. I think it creates a, at least a mental advantage to the Rockets, that we're in your head and you don't trust what you've been doing all year. JaVale so or LeBron he... would have to go straight to Frankfurt. What do you think, Robbie? I mean, <laughs> but that won't happen. Okay, we'll see. Game yeah, one, do you think he does? I'm sort of 50-50. Game I, one, I think no. I don't see how we can keep him in there. I mean, you watch, did you watch the game today? Every single setup was a five out. They don't run anything else but five out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, Tom, it, it, like I agree 100% with Rafael. shots, man. I'm, that guy was raining threes today. I'm agreeing with Rafael right now that they are going to, in game one, have the same lineup that got them there. You, you, you go to the dance with what brought you there, my friend. That's, that's the old adage, and they're going to go to it. Now, if they find it to be problematic. Like you're going in a poker contest and you take the girl that was doing the poker and you're, and you're going into a hip hop concert. Well, that's again, you know, hey. good. there you go. We'll go ahead and love off there. I don't see, I wouldn't see a change until game three, unless game one is so bad. But uh, I, I think at this point in time, if you're going to see a change, it won't be until game three. Three is greater than two guys. Uh, no, I agree. I just think that, He's going to stick with his lineup. I mean, people have been asking for Kuzma to start all year. Yep. And you can make a case and say that maybe he started JaVale to save AD so he wouldn't have to take a pounding during the regular season. And um, Let those six, seven guys pound on him is what I'd say. Yeah, but I think AD is going to have to play 42 to 43 minutes a game because as soon as Dwight or JaVale comes in, it's advantage Houston. If yep, I'm Dan Tony, as soon as I see those guys, Westbrook, you're in. I don't care if you're tired. We're running the offense. We're going to hunt a switch, and we're going to get Westbrook on Dwight or JaVale, and pew. Or, so. or step backs, because Dwight will never guard uh, anybody shooting yep. from the three. Sean, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, no, I was just, I was just going to add to that, Gerald. I was just going to say, you know, I, I really do think that um, – Houston does have some some wrinkles that they can throw at the Lakers uh, defensively, where I think they can make it uh, interesting. But uh, you know, looking back at this series, uh, in Game Five, Anthony Davis had forty three points on eighteen field goal attempts. For all the uh, advanced stats nerds out there, that's a, a peak of about two point three nine. That's incredible. Crazy. Yeah. It's yeah, let let's throw the ball in AD guys and you know what? 
got a pretty good chance of getting at least almost two and a half points. If he gets to the line anywhere near what Harden does in the series. Oh, if he matches him uh, shot for shot, that that's it. Yeah. That's it. I think it's, I think but, it's advantage Lakers. If that's the case, if he gets anywhere near what Harden gets in a, at a, any given point in time. So it is. And I think that's what Laker time wants. Yeah, because if you double well, team, and, and he's not getting to the line. Thing, right. That there, there's no home team, home crowd in this series. Excuse me. So I, I, I think you're going to have to call it down the middle. If you're giving James calls, you're going to get have to give AD calls. Lakers are going to be off for like five days or something like that. It's going to be, again, game one is the best chance that the Rockets are going to have. We're signaling the ref for a quick timeout, but we'll be back with more of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. Check out what's been going on with the Pop Culture Cosmo Show and the PCC Multiverse. The better that these Marvel films do, the higher the standards are going to be for not just other films in general, but other Marvel films also. I think it's really hard to end a show with this many fans in a satisfying way. That's the Pop Culture Cosmo Show. And the PCC Multiverse. Playing worldwide on radio seven days a week and wherever you get your podcasts. Well, we'll see what happens later this week when it comes to the Houston Rockets and the Los Angeles Lakers. If that ultimately ends up being the case, we got one more game for the Houston Rockets to finish off. But it's looking more and more like it because they did go, like I said, on a toward pace in the second half when they went and they finished off the Oklahoma City Thunder 114 to 80. They just killed them in the second half. Raphael, your quick thoughts on why Oklahoma City just collapsed. They were only down by three at the half. They had made up a a nice run, and it was looking pretty good right there for Oklahoma City, but in the second half, it just imploded from there. I think losing Schroeder hurt. I mean, he was their leading scorer at the time, and at first, I didn't see the you know, the play that why uh, Tucker was so angry. And then once I saw the replays, it made total sense. Um, and I don't know if they'll be suspended because I think Giannis got suspended for a headbutt, right? Yep. Or did he just get ejected? I think he got one game. He got, so one he got game. ejected and a suspension. Yeah. Bubble game. And the what's last, that? The last bubble game. Yeah. So I wonder how the NBA is going to rule with I, this situation. I, I personally don't think – Man, it, like it's really hard to suspend a guy in the playoffs. Done it, it before. Really Phoenix Suns disagree. So did Golden <laughs> State with Draymond Green. Touche. Yeah, yeah. If Draymond got suspended in the finals. <laughs> yeah, then... right. Just saying. Just saying. I think they but will. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, go ahead. I, I like Schroeder. I, I like Schroeder, though. Uh, I wouldn't mind him on the Lakers. Okay, oh, Tom. Yeah. Uh, calm down on it. We're getting everybody on the Lakers here. <laughs> Raphael, go ahead. Yeah, I just think that the Thunder lost uh, Schroeder. He was killing he was killing the Rockets. And then um, they did a good job of hunting out Gilgis Alexander. They just exposed him defensively. And then Chris Paul, I don't remember what he did during the game. So it's kind of tough then, you know, to beat Houston if Chris Paul is not playing at a really, really high level. And then I just think overall Houston is better. Westbrook even if he wasn't playing 100% and didn't look good on paper, he just adds a different dynamic to that team, and they have another ball handler. And, you know, when Harden was – when Westbrook was out, Harden was still their main ball handler. And then when he's out the game, they're having more so like combo guards that aren't really distributors running the offense. So Westbrook just was the difference in this game, even though he didn't have like this great performance. So – it was that was a, my opinion. Why they that came out better? I, I agree with you because, like you said, go ahead, Laker Tom. It's you know the challenge, and, and this is why I really feel so strongly that that Ogle's got to make a change in the starting lineup. It's almost impossible when you've got five guys spread out behind the three point line, and two of them are James Harden and Russell Westbrook. I mean, my God, it's just like. Well, it's a, it's like college football with their whole, the whole game you know? is drive and dish, drive and dish. You know, <laughs> it's just over and over, drive and dish, drive and dish until you get a wide open three or a layup. That's the whole game, and that's why I really feel like the, the you know that running a 
running his own defense with a center in there who could block shots is probably the best way to stop these guys as well as double teaming Arden. Um, it's, you know, they've taken that, they've taken this whole, this whole analytics thing to, to the ultimate extreme, you know, um, and, and over and over, Maury keeps reinventing how it's really supposed to work. And D'Antoni does too. Well, you know, I, everybody, thought, everybody thought Westbrook would not be a fit in that at all because he's not really a good three point shooter, but his attacking of the attacking to the rim and getting free throws is perfect for that drive and dish offense of theirs. Okay, Sean, you had something? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, um, Tom was, was uh, and rightfully so, mentioning Maury's um, uh, intellect, but how about Sam Presti? He, he found Andre Robertson and managed to integrate him into their system, and he proved to be a valuable defender, and now he's done the same thing with Dort. I mean, this guy is a really great player. Um, I see a lot of positives moving forward with the Thunder now to build around uh, Jay. Now you have a 3 and D guy. Um, so he's slow. I don't know about three. Yeah, yeah, well, let's, well, let's, let's go. I think he'll work on his shot. I think he'll work on his shot. But I see a lot of positive attributes with trying to build around Shea and, and putting, you know, uh, defenders and athletes around him. Because... He had he had a tough game, pretty much had a tough series. Uh, I I just think he'll get better with time as well. He's a he's a talented kid. Raphael, mm-hmm. any last thoughts on this series before we head to the Milwaukee? You know, we just got to go ahead the obligatory Milwaukee <laughs> before we go ahead on them. That that series was on today. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Houston wins. I think that. Um, I mean, it's going to set up the matchup that I think a lot of people want to see. I think this is going to be such a different contrast in styles. And I think if you probably would have asked an unbiased NBA fan, like what matchups would they have wanted to see in the playoffs? I think Lakers, Houston in round two, and then Lakers, sure. Clippers in the Western Conference Finals. And, and I mean, it looks like we're yeah, heading, What's that? They're going to get what they want, I think. Yeah, so it's it's going to be – I mean, I can't wait. I think even in the, the Eastern Conference, the second-round series are going to be good in the yeah. West. I mean, even with this Lakers-Houston, even, even though it seems like we're already saying Houston is the shoe-in to, to win, the pressure's on the Rockets. Well, the pressure's on both teams, but if the Rockets – it in the past. What's that? The Rockets have been known to blow it in the past, too, in the playoffs, so – well, that's what I was saying about earlier. Every team in the last five years, no team has been consistent either. Well, and first and, round. No, or, I was just gonna say, Billy Donovan hasn't he won two national championships at Florida? So it's not like he's averse to playing in elimination games. Yeah, yeah, I just don't think they have the talent. I, I think Chris Paul is a great leader in a sense, but in the fourth quarter, even though their lineup was listed as like the most clutch lineup in the season. I don't know if they can beat a healthy Houston team, even semi-healthy Houston team. But as far as like the next round, I mean, it's going to be a, a great chess match. And the, Dan Tony's coaching for his Rockets life. <laughs> and maybe Frank's even more. Checkers. What's that? And Frank's playing checkers. Yeah, <laughs> but maybe even Daryl Morey, if the Lakers come out and let's just say they smack Houston around and it's not competitive, they are going to have to, I mean, that team is built just for one way. They're going to have to make some changes. And then, you know, you can even look at the situation where Morey costs the NBA and the Rockets a lot of money. So I think there's a lot of pressure on Houston yeah. to win this. Very much so indeed. And to finish off the day and playoffs, yeah, there was Raphael in the third game. And I know you saw it. And that was Milwaukee 118 to 104 to finish off the Orlando Magic. Four Why games don't we to one. The Heat series instead. <laughs> well, that's what I want to mention. Yeah, it was just coasting all the way by Milwaukee. Anybody who saw the game saw Giannis Tentacumpo just basically took the team, said, let's go, let's finish this off. And they coast. they got out to a nice lead, and it just never was close from there. 
So moving on to that series with Miami, your thoughts on it real quick as we go into a second round between Miami and Milwaukee. Laker Tom, do Miami really, 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 do they really stand and have a chance against the Milwaukee Bucks? Oh, yeah, I think they do. They they have one of the few guys other than the Lakers have. Lakers have two of them who can who can defend the Giannis in the post, um, and the and the uh, the Heat do too. Plus, they have they have the outside shooters to to take uh, Milwaukee's uh, drop coverage defense and really make them pay. Sean, um, do you think that's the key? Is the three point shooting for Miami? Oh no doubt, Gerald. That 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 will be the key. It it it's it if you can make a few shots on that Bucks defense, they tend to get a little lazy or I don't want to say lazy. What I'm saying is usually the Well their defense is designed third, to give up three pointers. It is, yeah. it is. Corner threes too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but if you if yeah. you notice if what you get multiple guys. possessions against that team, they tend to lose a little bit of focus, and they tend to um, go into bad habits. Bledsoe, specifically, if he's on the floor, I would look for Miami and Spo to to exploit him. However, I could. And then there's a situation where they're similar to the Lakers in that. They do give up a lot of corner threes, and and that's something that, again, uh, is going to be the key. Raphael, I want to hear your thoughts on this situation as you and I are going to be reporting going forward with Miami and Milwaukee, and we're going to be covering it every day when it comes to the NBA playoffs. But some of the things that you were looking at when you see a matchup between Miami and Milwaukee, I'm looking forward to seeing how effective Jimmy Butler can be against Milwaukee as opposed to not just seeing everybody on Milwaukee and Giannis and all that being effective against Miami. I think Miami wins this series. And I think that um, there's going to be a lot of threes. It's going to be bombs away, which you're not used to seeing in the Eastern Conference. You know, you're used to slow down, kind of grind it out physical game. I think it may have some elements of that, but both teams are heavily reliant on the three-point shot. Not like the Rockets, but, you know, Miami's, you know, when they go with Robinson and Hero and and they shoot a lot of threes, and then obviously Milwaukee's entire offense is based off of Giannis getting the rebound and straight line drives and throwing it out to um, uh, to three-point shooters. Uh, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, I want to ask you guys a question. Don't you think one of the big keys would be if uh, Spo can get Giannis to the line a lot? I mean, he's not – not a great free throw shooter. But he's not, but I think because he attacks so much, it's kind of like the theory with the Rockets and their threes. They don't shoot a high percentage from threes, but because they shoot so many, there is an advantage. And I think with Giannis, he's always in attack mode. And he puts and you so, in foul trouble. He gets you on yeah. your heels. And that goes yeah. ahead and spreads it out for their offense even more. The Kyle Corvers, the Middletons, the all their shooters that they have on their team, they now have more room to operate. And you cannot give those shooters enough room to operate. And if you because if you do, you're going to pay the price. And and that's what that's why Giannis Antetokounmpo works so well with that team because when he's hopping and when he puts people in foul trouble and when he puts people on their heels. He's going to go ahead and make it a lot easier for those three-point shooters to be more effective and operate. So you you, you might be willing to go ahead if you're Miami and say, you know what, I want to keep Bam on the floor. I'm just going to go ahead and let Giannis go for 40 and a lot of dunks. I'm just going to go ahead and try and see what I can do on the perimeter to stop Middleton and maybe DiVincenzo over Eric Bledsoe if you want to go ahead and really come down to it because DiVincenzo has been playing uh, a little bit above his, his norm so far in the bubble, so... I don't know if that's who you want to target, but I, I definitely would want to go ahead and see if I can single out Middleton for sure. But before we head on out, I want to go ahead uh, and pay our respects to a uh, great Portland Trailblazer and also a very, very solid NBA player, former All-Star Clifford Robinson, who passed away at the age of 53. Also, they honor Lute Olsen and also the man himself, King T'Challa, 
Black Panther, uh, you know, Chadwick Boseman, one of the great actors that's out there. Obviously, everybody knows him from playing King T'Challa as the Black Panther, but he had so many other great roles. Jackie Robinson, 42. He was in Death Five Bloods, which is one of the best movies to come out this year. So much more. Gone so soon at age 43. Laker Tom, Raphael, Magic Man, any last thoughts on any one of those three guys before we head on out? I know, Raphael, you would as far as for Cliffy B, uh, you know, because he was such a good Portland Trailblazer for you guys. You know the old saying, death comes in threes, and it's like mm. this weekend just kind of lived up to to that saying. Um, and just different ages. I mean, I think Lute Olsen was, was he in his 80s? Yes. And then Cliff was 53, and then um, Bozeman was 43. And I, we haven't heard what uh, the cause of death was for Cliff Robinson. I know he had some health issues, and he had a stroke before. And so... I mean, I guess I can assume that may have been the reason, which I, I don't know. But either way, it's sad. Um, and I think Bozeman was the biggest shock um, because there weren't any signs, at least to my knowledge, there weren't any signs. He did not make that it public. He was Ill. Yeah. And even like the people around him, you know, they in, in, in the era that we live in where everybody wants a breaking story and somebody wants to, you know, make a name for themselves by telling the celebrity's business. Everyone that was in his camp and his entourage, friends, family, they all kept this a secret. Like nobody knew. Then I guess looking back at, I've seen like different videos and pictures that he must've did on live within maybe like the last couple of months that there were maybe some signs that he was ill. But I think a lot of people thought maybe he was preparing for a new role. So it kind of, it definitely caught me off guard. I wasn't, you know, I didn't know that he was sick at all. Just a, a tremendous loss. And I'll be covering it more on the Pop Culture Cosmos on Monday's show. But, yeah, just a tremendous loss for, for everyone out there. Such a skilled actor. Cliffy B, uh, what a what a tremendous player he was in the league. And Lute Olsen, national championship coach, need I say more. But, Tom, any last thoughts on this before we head on out? Um, the one thing that really struck me was uh... – the last tweet that uh, Bozeman sent off was yes. congratulations to Kamala Harris. Um, so, you know, it's uh, thinking of the right things, even, even at the end. Absolutely. So, and his tweet of he, his passing. He was one of my favorite actors. Yes. So was, uh, and I didn't know, I just like, just like Raphael, I, I really wasn't aware of it. I mean, I just, I just watched uh, 49 or 59 bridges, whatever it was the other day. And I, uh, you know, I just, it's like, Wow, this and then I read that the, the last three or four movies that he made actually were during this period yeah. where he had colon cancer since 2016. But yes, uh, he unfortunately has left us all too soon. Uh, just a tremendous actor. Again, I'll be covering more on it uh, with his uh, passing on our Monday show, the Pop Culture Cosmos, for anybody out there interested. But yeah, there's still more to talk about when it comes to the NBA playoffs. I do want to go ahead and pay our respects to the families from all of us here at the Lakers Fast Break. Uh, and of course, Raphael Barlow and the NBA Draft Junkies, just for all three of those families, our thoughts are with you. A tremendous loss for basketball and also pop culture. Uh, and I'll tell you what, guys, uh, we're looking forward to what we're seeing come ahead for the Los Angeles Lakers and possibly Houston Rockets. It's going to be very interesting to see. But the playoffs, they've been good so far. But I also want to go ahead and close out on the note that let us not forget exactly what happened this week and why it happened because there's still things that need to be taken care of in our society. So before we head on out, guys, I'll go with you, Laker Tom, first. So you can also go ahead and lead into what you're talking about, Lakerholics.com, is the, the still the Black Lives Matter movement, why it still needs to be now more than ever your opportunity out there to make a change and make a change that's worth lasting. Well, I think that uh, this three-day strike, despite the chaos and the controversy over, you know, how it happened and how it was resolved and what feelings were hurt by certain people and so forth. Um, I think what really came out of it is that uh, we've really got the NBA standing up and, and, and delivering and LeBron James, basically, in, in my opinion, uh, we said, we thought for a moment there that Raphael was wrong, but I don't think he was. This whole thing was LeBron James choreographing and making sure that he held the league accountable, uh, making sure that uh, uh, 
uh, they need to do more. It's not enough just to put the logo on the court and the backs of jerseys and so forth. And and all of the things that uh, he got, the three main concessions that, that he and Chris Paul got were the things that were at the heart of what they had been talking about, which was protecting and promoting the the voting rights of African-Americans and minorities. Um, and so they got this coalition between uh, owners and players to support uh, minority voting. They got the agreements to open up all of the arenas that were in control of the NBA so that they could be safe polling places. Um, I'd love to see them be places where they could also, people could go to register to vote. Um, and then lastly, they've, they've got agreements that the sponsors, the NBA and its sponsors would put together a series of commercials that they will run during the, during the games uh, all the way through the finals that basically promote, educate people on what their situation is in voting and, and encourage people in the minority communities to vote. Um, their voting percentages are less than the white population. A fewer percentage of their people vote, and and if we can equalize that so that you have equality and at least in making your representation, that would be a, go a long way toward making the country, uh, making the government of the country reflect the population of the country. And what are you guys talking about on LakerHolics.com before we head to Raphael? Um, we've been talking a lot about what happened in the last three days. That's been really the, the major topic. Everybody sort of presumed that we were going to win the game against the Blazers. No disrespect to Portland. But everybody's looking ahead now to the next next round of the playoffs. And uh, and I think all of us are, like, like you two, grateful that, hey, we're going to see basketball. Um, I don't know how touch and go it really was because I think that LeBron and the Lakers never, ever really I, – I don't believe for a second that LeBron really ever intended to take his ball and go home. Um, he's always had two goals, which was to win a championship and do everything he could for his people. Um, so I, at any rate, there must, there must have been some risk there because you don't, you don't get the concessions that you get without playing power, and sometimes you have to take a risk there. And I think he, he took some risk that there might not be playoffs. All right, and, those, and there's a lot of things you're discussing on that. You're discussing it at Bakerholics.com. Be part of the conversation today where you see some stuff from Sean Grice, AK Magic Man, Jamie Sweet. You'll see Rafael Barlow's videos up there for Lakers Draft Junkies. That's there from NBA Draft Junkies. And, of course, Laker Tom, you're going to see a lot of his stuff that's coming over from Medium there as well. It is Lakerholics.com, and I will be posting my mock draft 3.0 on there this weekend as well. But before we end on out, Raphael, the floor is yours. Any last thoughts on the way out? Yeah, I mean, this was an interesting week as far as basketball. It's nothing like I've seen in my lifetime. And even like for me, I, I didn't post any videos the last few days because, I mean, if the players aren't playing or, or anything like that, I just wanted to, you know, kind of do my part in a sense. And as far as just kind of taking a couple of days off, as far as just like posting content on the internet, because I mean, my NBA draft stuff is not really relevant to what's going on. So, um, but I did post the video today. Uh, by the time this uh, airs, uh, my mock draft 2.0, the second half of it, picks 15 through 30, will be up. And um, so, yeah, I mean, just overall working on the site, updating the site, and trying to create a lot of video content. It's kind of, man, I've been super busy simply because in order to do this podcast effectively, I have to be able to watch NBA games, which start all day. Now that the first round is pretty much almost over, it won't be from central time from noon to 10 PM every day. So I should have a little bit more, more free time, but yeah, I've just been working on the site and updating it and um, just trying to keep up with everything that's going on in this crazy world that we live in in 2020 it is crazy i will i will agree with you wholeheartedly on that it's been crazy and 2020 has been uh some year and it will go down if, for a long time in history as being quite a year that has been but tomorrow Raphael and i will be back on here for the lakers fast break we'll be covering the game six for denver and utah game six for los angeles clippers and dallas and also the first game, game one for Boston and Toronto. Looks like it's going to be a very interesting day tomorrow. So Raphael will definitely have 
a lot of words to say, and along with me right here at the Lakers Fast Break. If you have any questions for any of us, at Barlow500, at NBA Draft Junkies for Raphael, at Laker Tom, when you want to go ahead and complain about his crazy trade proposals, but also as well share your thoughts on the Lakers. And for me, it's at Lakers Fast Break. If you have any questions for us, we're all on Twitter. We're all there to answer them. And of course, any comments you have for us. And you know, if you think I'm crazy as well, there you go. Because it fits right in with a crazy 2020. Also as well, you want to go ahead and check out Sean Grice, a.k.a. Magic Man on Lakerholics.com. I want to give him a shout out. Laker Tom, Raphael, I want to thank each and every one of you guys for staying by with us for the entire hour and eight minutes. So truly appreciate it. Again, if everybody's out there watching and listening, please support us as best as you can because any support for either one of us uh, and the the outlets that we have and the outlets that we put so much detail and time into is truly appreciated thanks so much for watching thanks so much for listening and we'll see you tomorrow right here at the lakers fast break podcast